Hi everyone, I'm Catherine and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be all about vintage sewing machines. I'm going to talk all about why I love them so much, why they are the only machine I pretty much ever sew on, what to look for, where to find them if you want a vintage sewing machine, how to take care of them, and how to sew with them because it actually can be a little different sewing with vintage machines as opposed to modern machines. So without further ado, let's jump right into the video. So my channel here on YouTube, as you'll know if you've been watching me for any amount of time, is all about historical and vintage inspired sewing. And much like how me and those of you who enjoy this kind of content love the aesthetic and the feel of historically inspired clothes, not just the look of them, but also the feel of natural fibers like linen and cotton. I like to use that same comparison for why I love vintage sewing machines so much and why they're basically the only sewing machine I choose to use. So first of all, let's just talk about aesthetics, just how they look. When it comes to a historical aesthetic versus a modern aesthetic, we see common themes, not just when it comes to sewing machines, but when it comes to the world in general, clothing, architecture, so many different things. So historically, it seems to me, and I think to many of you as well, that they put a lot more effort, not just into function and utility, but aesthetics, they wanted their, their household items, their clothing to look beautiful as well as work beautifully. And there is no better description for why vintage sewing machines are so beautiful. Their lines are just so curving and organic looking. They just, they're really pleasing to the eye. They have these beautiful decals on them. Now let's compare that to modern machines. Most modern sewing machines, if not all of them, have a very different aesthetic. They are very boxy looking, straight lines, a lot clunkier, and I'm not necessarily using the word clunky in a demeaning way. They still work fine, of course, but when I say clunky, I just mean like they take up a lot more space than these vintage machines. They're less streamlined, I should say. They're very boxy and they fill up a lot of space. They're completely made of plastic, whereas of course vintage machines are made of metal. This one's cast iron. Of course, usually modern machines are just a solid color, like white, whereas the vintage machines were often black or another bright color, or they have decals on them. So it's just a very different aesthetic. And in my opinion, chances are that if you appreciate historical fashion, you'll also appreciate vintage sewing machines and their beautiful aesthetic. Okay, so now I'd like to talk a bit about the feeling of sewing on a vintage or historical machine versus sewing on a modern machine. So I started sewing at about the age of nine on a Janome machine that my parents bought for me. And it was a great machine and I still have it and I still use it occasionally for certain things that my vintage machines can't do like zigzags. But there's just no comparison when it comes to the feeling of sewing on that plastic, more modern machine versus sewing on one of these historical machines. Now, for obvious reasons, this isn't necessarily something I can just explain to you in words. It's more of a visceral thing. And just trust me when I say that if you try a vintage machine, you will notice a difference. And chances are you might like it better than the feeling of working on a modern machine. The only words I can use to describe it is that it feels much more smooth and streamlined and less like you're kind of struggling against the machine, which is the feeling I get with modern machines and more like you're working with the machine. Like the machine is just an extension of you. That's really the only way I can explain it. Okay, so now I'll get a bit more into the utility reasons as to why I prefer vintage sewing machines. So not only do they look more beautiful, they just feel more satisfying, more enjoyable to sew with. They also tend to work better than most modern machines in my personal experience. So I'll talk more about their stitch quality later, but just suffice it to say that the old adage is kind of true about doing one thing 
and doing it really well, as opposed to doing a lot of things all mediocre. I definitely don't have the words right on that, but that's the best way I can describe these vintage machines. So if you look at modern machines, the focus is much more on being able to do a million different things all in one machine. You have like 20 different stitches you can choose from. You can do embroidery, you can do zigzags, you can do all sorts of crazy fancy stitches. You can, it's computerized, you can program it to do different things. Whereas these vintage machines, literally the only thing they do is a straight stitch, but they do that straight stitch so very, very, very well that many people choose to use vintage machines just for the quality of the straight stitch when it comes to doing things like top stitching where the quality of your straight stitch is very important. And that is actually the reason why I initially was attracted to my vintage machine. Of course, I already knew I wanted one, but the moment I tried it, I immediately saw the potential for these vintage machines when it comes to things like corsetry, where you're sewing many, many lines of vertical stitching to create boning channels or cording channels and all of those stitches are just so visible that it really becomes important to have good quality. And let's, let's talk about speed now. These vintage machines in my experience can often sew faster than modern machines and do it in a way where it's less likely to cause issues. I've been able to push my modern machine to go really fast but it almost always ends up in a jam where your thread is just all over the place jammed up and you have to take out the bobbin and get the jam out. That very rarely happens for me on my vintage machines. Of course it does happen, but usually it's traceable to a direct cause. I'll give you an example. When I first got my green vintage machine, I did actually experience a lot of thread jams, but it turns out that that was because I was using the wrong size of bobbin. My bobbin was a little too large, which led to the thread loops from the needle going down and getting caught on the bobbin, and then it created a jam. So I was having jams, but it was traceable to a direct cause, which I was able to correct, and then I didn't get jams anymore. Whereas if I compare that to my experience sewing on my more modern machine, Machine, I would just get jams for no apparent reason and it was very very frustrating especially as a beginning sewer. So another reason why I love vintage machines is how long they last and how easy they are to take care of on your own. So if you flip up a vintage sewing machine in its cabinet and look at the bottom of it you can see how very simple these machines are. There's really just a few components. They're all made of metal. They're not easy to break and they're very easy to look at yourself, clean yourself, oil yourself, and even potentially assess a problem all on your own, either in the bottom of the machine or if you take off the side plate. On the needle side, you can see the few parts in there. You can oil them, you can vacuum in there, or dust in there. It's very easy to take care of on your own. Whereas you can oil modern machines on your own. And in fact, it is recommended to do that every so often, but there's just so many more parts and most of them are not accessible when it comes to the stuff in the bottom of the machine. Especially this is true when it comes to the most modern machines which are all computerized. So now not only are there the sewing machine components but there's this computer built into the machine which of course the everyday sewer is not going to be able to fix on their own. They're going to need to take it to a professional, probably to a certified dealer of their specific brand of machine. And chances are it could cost a lot more to fix something that breaks in a complicated computerized machine versus a very simple machine like a vintage one. And obviously when it comes to the longevity of sewing machines, the more simply they operate, the more chances of it lasting a long time. And conversely, the more complicated a machine is, the more chances there are of something breaking and it therefore not lasting a long time. And I think that is the, the reason why we see so many historical machines, even from as far back as the 1800s, which are still in perfect running order today. Or even if they aren't in perfect running order, all they need is a cleaning and an oiling and a tune-up, and then they will be in running order. Whereas I highly doubt that there's going to be many of these computerized, complex sewing machines left 200 years from now. Now, another reason why I love vintage sewing machines, and I would actually highly recommend one to a beginning sewer, is the reason that they're easily accessible 
and they're inexpensive in the sense that you can get a lot of machine for your money. Let's just say there's someone who wants to learn how to sew, but they don't have a lot of money to invest into a fancy sewing machine. Maybe one or $200 is the maximum they can spend on a machine. So let's just say they go to Walmart or they go to a sewing machine store and they have their one or $200 and they try to buy a machine with that amount of money. The kind of machine they're going to be able to buy with that is a cheap, all plastic. So we're not talking about just the outside being plastic, but actually the parts on the inside being plastic, which is very low quality, very high likelihood of it breaking soon. That's the machine they're going to be able to get very low end beginner machine, all plastic. It's going to break really quick. It can't do very much. And the things that it can do, chances are it's not going to do them that great. The stitches might not even look that great. Whereas you can get historical machines for as cheaply as for free for, you know, probably no more than $200. You can get a really, really good historical machine. And like I said, these machines work so well. The straight stitching quality is just amazing. And especially if you are someone who is drawn to historical sewing, but you're a beginner, these machines are really all you're going to need. You don't need all those fancy zigzag stitches because if you're drawn to historical sewing, they didn't have zigzag stitches except for what they sewed by hand, of course, but they used seam finishes and garment finishes that only needed the use of a straight stitch or perhaps some hand stitching as well. And by the way, just so you know what you're getting when you're getting a vintage sewing machine, you are getting a lot of machine for your money. When these machines first came out, people were spending as much money on, or as we might spend on an automobile today, that's how much they were spending to get a sewing machine back then. They were going into massive debt to buy these machines. Now, of course, there was the fact that they were a novelty, they were a new technology, and of course that would have made the prices higher, but they were also just really, really high quality machines that were meant to last, that were meant to maybe set up a business with a sewing machine to be able to output tons of clothing or sewn items as a business. They were meant to be high quality and they were meant to last. In fact, Singer 201s, which was I'm actually not sure when the Singer 201s were around. Singer 201s are known as the Rolls Royce of sewing machines. And in fact, they were actually used in the Rolls Royce factories to sew the cushion covers because the straight stitch on them was just phenomenal. It was just such good quality. So that's the kind of machine you're getting when you're getting a vintage sewing machine, except you're able to get it so inexpensively nowadays. And that's the great thing about it. So many people you know probably have a vintage sewing machine in their attic or in their garage or in their basement. Maybe it was their grandmother's or their mother's. Many people are giving them away at garage sales or selling them very inexpensively. You can find them online on Kijiji or Craigslist. We'll get more into that later. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about the straight stitch only factor when it comes to these vintage machines, because I think that is something that potentially scares a lot of people off of trying a vintage machine because they've become dependent on their zigzag stitch or on may maybe even a serger. Of course, you could use a serger in combination with this, but anyways, maybe they've become dependent on using a zigzag to finish their seams and they think, well, vintage machines only do a straight stitch, so I can't use that. But let's talk a a little bit more about that. First of all, like I've already mentioned, the fact that these machines only do a straight stitch is actually a good thing because it means that they do the straight stitch so very, very well. And of course, if you really, really wanted to have modern seam finishes, you could always invest on in a serger and use a serger on the side of your vintage sewing machine. And that would be a really great combo because you get the really great straight stitching of the vintage machine, but you still get the modern seam finish from the serger. So that would be an example of using using two different specialized pieces of equipment that both do their one thing really well, as opposed to modern machines, which are trying to do it all, but then they don't do as good of a job at all of those things than if they were specialized. Another great thing about these machines is that they are super, super strong. They can really just, they can sew through denim. They can even sew through thin leather. In fact, I am planning on using this new new black vintage sewing machine for sh sewing my shoe uppers, which will be made out of quite thin leather. So it's quite doable, but this machine I've tested it and it does a really great job sewing through 
two layers of the leather I'm going to be using for my shoe uppers. It's just so strong. It just breezes through sewing through thick things and it's really amazing compared to modern machines which really really struggle and in my opinion that's why there is such an emphasis today on people who need the strength of a sewing machine just going and getting an industrial machine because the consumer level machines these days can't come like they even struggle sewing through denim, let alone trying to sew through leather or something thicker than that. Whereas these machines, it, I wouldn't call it an industrial machine, but it's definitely like a semi-industrial machine, if you got my meaning. It's, it's like halfway there. So it's a really great investment in that sense. And as I already mentioned, if you're into historical sewing, there's a lot of historical garments such as corsets where the speed and quality of your straight stitching is really important. And in those instances, I would again, really recommend a vintage machine. But let's talk about some alternate ways of finishing seams if you're really scared of, you know, how am I going to make garments without a zigzag stitch? Let's talk about that. So all throughout history until very recently, they either, they either didn't have sewing machines at all, or they only had sewing machines that did a straight stitch. And so they had to come up with other ways to finish their seams. Now, of course, when everything was sewn by hand, they would just finish the seam by hand, and that was what they were used to. But if you still like the speed and convenience of constructing garments by machine, there are lots of really high quality seam finishes, which are actually considered to make a garment much higher quality and look more attractive and last longer than something like a zigzag stitch. And that was one of the reasons why that wasn't something that really scared me with vintage machines. It's because I'd already kind of looked into the style of sewing that I was personally drawn to doing and I was drawn to the couture type of sewing where you're constructing garments with an eye for longevity and beauty and strength more than just quickly whipping things off and getting it done but it's not going to last very long and it's not going to look nice and there's lots of seam finishes that you can see me using in my sewing videos like flat felled seams or French seams which barely take any extra time in fact they probably don't take much more time than zigzagging your edges would take. It really just requires one extra pass of your seam with a straight stitch, but it highly increases the strength of your seam and the beauty of your seam, both from the outside of the garment as well as the inside of the garment. And there are tons of resources online and here on YouTube for alternate ways of finishing seams if you don't have a zigzag stitch. So I would definitely look into that before writing off vintage machines because they don't do a zigzag. Okay, so what about doing buttonholes, someone might ask, because these modern machines have these buttonhole stitching features, and if I get a vintage machine, am I going to have to sew all my buttonholes by hand? Well, first of all, sewing buttonholes by hand actually isn't as hard as it sounds, and if you watch any of my previous videos where I'm sewing things with buttons, most of the time I was doing it by hand. There is a way to sew beautiful machine buttonholes using a vintage machine. And the way to do that is by getting a vintage Singer buttonholer, they're called. Most of the time they're by the Singer brand, although you can get them from other brands as well. And they're highly available on eBay, Craigslist, that kind of thing. And in fact, I've heard many people say that they find the buttonholes done by these vintage buttonholer attachments to be much more beautiful and high quality than buttonholes done on a modern sewing machine. I definitely have an eye on getting a buttonholer sometime in the future. Currently, I am either sewing my buttonholes by hand or using my modern machine just for the purpose of sewing buttonholes, but I'm usually not too pleased with the quality of the buttonholes, so I definitely want to try a buttonholer. It's basically like a big foot attachment for your machine. So you put it on and it comes with different templates that you put into it for making different sizes and shapes of buttonholes. And then it works through pure mechanics. Obviously it's not computerized because they didn't have that technology back then. I can't explain to you exactly how it works, but it works in a mechanical manner to get these buttonholes sewn and it does it really, really well and really beautifully. There's a lot of resources online and here on YouTube about how to use these buttonholers. So I definitely recommend checking that out if buttonholes are something that intimidates you. So one more question I've been asked about vintage sewing machines is about gathering stitches. Are you able to make stitches large enough for a gathering stitch? And the answer is definitely yes. These stitches on vintage sewing machines are just as adjustable as modern machines. You can adjust from very, very large stitches to very, very tiny stitches, and you can use them for basting. I have had trouble on my green machine in the past with making gathering stitches. The stitches are able to be large enough, but usually when they're so large, the 
tension doesn't work out to be, be enough, just be the right tension balance to create gathering stitches. And what I mean by gathering stitches is just large stitches that you pull up on to gather the fabric up. So in the past, I have resorted to doing this by hand. I don't know if this was my particular green vintage sewing machine or if it's something that applies to all vintage machines, but sewing gathering stitches by hand doesn't have to be that big of a deal. I've also been asked about the backstitch features of vintage machines. Are they able to do backstitching? And the answer in most cases is yes. My black machine here does a backstitch beautifully. My green vintage machine does a backstitch beautifully. And in fact, I even have a treadle machine from about 1915 in my basement, totally non-electric. It works through using this treadle paddle with your foot and working this treadle with your foot. And even it does a backstitch. So I think you don't, that's not something you have to worry about. Most of these vintage machines do have a backstitch. But again, even if you find one that doesn't do a backstitch, that's not really anything to worry about. Before people did backstitching, they would simply leave their thread tails long and just knot it off and cut the, cut the tails short. It's not really that big of a deal. And in fact, there are some classes of thought that it's higher quality to not do backstitching and to instead knot off your threads. But again, that's not really something you have to worry about because most of these machines do do a backstitch. Okay, so now that I've been raving so much about how great these vintage sewing machines are, let's say you're saying, Catherine, you know, I'm convinced, I want one. Where do I find one? Where do I buy a vintage sewing machine? So like I said earlier, you can find these anywhere and everywhere. I mean, chances are there could be someone in your neighborhood or someone in your acquaintance who has one in their basement that they're not using because it was their grandmother's or their mother's and they're not a sewer. Maybe they don't even know it's a sewing machine because most of these sewing machines come built into their cabinet and they just fold away into their cabinet and the cabinet can just become a little death. And many people have these in their attic or their basement and they don't even know that it's a sewing machine. They just think it's an old table. So ask around people you know, check out yard sales, garage sales, or if you'd rather find one online, you can check out eBay, Etsy, Craigslist, Kijiji, that kind of thing. But like you can easily find someone in your, in your community selling it through a website like Craigslist. That's where I bought my green machine. This black machine here, I found it because a friend of mine, it's her hobby to kind of clean out old houses that are changing owners, empty out all the old stuff and then re renovate them. And there was a house that had been lived in by the same family for like 90 years and they were hoarders and they kept everything and they had a lot of sewing stuff. And they had this old machine which had been folded away in its cabinet for who knows how long. And that's why it's in such beautiful condition because it never really saw the light of day. So I'm sure you'll be able to find one no problem through one of those sources. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about what to look for when you're buying a vintage machine. And this is probably the most important section if you want to buy one, because chances are you're going to be able to find one pretty easily, but you wanna know what to look for. So the main thing to keep in mind is that since vintage machines are so readily available, you don't necessarily just wanna jump on the first one you find and buy it. If, you, if necessary, you wanna wait and take your time and find one that's going to best suit your needs and that's gonna work the best for you and that's gonna make your experience into vintage sewing machines and your transition into using them the best and the easiest possible. So like I said, while vintage sewing machines are very easy to fix most of the time, that doesn't mean you just wanna go ahead and buy one that you know is broken. Since there are so many around in our communities and in people's attics, you really don't have to buy one that's broken. You can wait until you find one where everything's working because that's just gonna make your job so much easier. So first of all, you want to make sure it has all its parts. So preferably it would be nice if you had one that came in a cabinet because most of these machines are designed to fit into a cabinet and it actually does make it pretty nice having one of these cabinets. You don't have to buy a separate sewing table and it gives you this nice flat surface and usually they have these extra pieces that extend out to give you more room to spread out your fabric when you're sewing. So if you have the space for it, it's definitely a nice thing to have and they're not very large. They're the size of a small desk when they're all folded up. So a cabinet would be nice. Now, you don't necessarily have to worry too much about the quality of the cabinet if it's not too important to you because the cabinets can be switched out. If you find one that doesn't have that great of a cabinet, you can buy another sewing machine cabinet somewhere and just switch them out. You definitely wanna make sure your sewing machine 
if it's electric, that it has a working pedal, that it has a cord that's working, that it has a motor that's working. Preferably even that it has a light that's working, although you could just change the light bulb if you have to, and if that's the only issue. Now you definitely want to do your best and make sure that it has a bobbin case because if the bobbin case is missing, that could be something that's more difficult to find and replace. And let's talk a bit about brands. So most vintage sewing machines are the Singer brand, and I would recommend looking for one that's a Singer. And that's not because they are better than other sewing machine companies that were around at the time, but just because if you ever need replacement parts for your sewing machine, which is quite likely, you're gonna have a much easier time of finding it if you're looking for something in the Singer family than if you're looking for something from a different brand. Trust me, I have experience with this. I have a 1915 treadle machine in my basement. It's a family heirloom. It was my husband's great, great grandmother's or something. I don't remember how many great, but it's in his family, so that's why I have it. But it's not a Singer brand, and I've tried to find matching parts for it. Sometimes they're interchangeable, but sometimes they're not, and I haven't had much luck in finding certain things for it because it's a different brand. Check to see if the bobbin winding apparatus works. Now this machine that I just got, it actually, it's not going to be able to wind bobbins because the bobbin winding apparatus is too worn down, but that wasn't of too much concern to me because I have other machines that I can wind bobbins on. But if it is important to you to have your machine wine bobbins, then definitely keep an eye out for that as well. And if possible, before you buy it, you want to test it to see if it's working, especially if it's an electric machine, just plug it in and briefly just try to run it, but don't do it too much because it's not good to run them before they've been cleaned and oiled. You also want to keep in mind about what you want. So do you want an electric vintage sewing machine or do you want a treadle vintage sewing machine? So treadles, like I mentioned before, they're non-electric. They work through, you know, working this big pedal with your foot that then turns a big belt that hooks up to the sewing machine and it runs the sewing machine. So if that's something that you definitely want, then go for it. But if you prefer the convenience of electric machines, then I would definitely recommend that for your first vintage sewing machine at least, because there's much less of a learning curve that way. Oh, and one more thing is you want to make sure that the whole tension apparatus on your machine is working. So the tension is part of the system that you thread the, your thread through when you go to sew, and it's what keeps the thread at the right tension to create beautiful stitches. So tension is something that can be fixed, but it's a lot easier if you can just find a machine that already has a good tension. Because tension is one thing where I'd say it's usually better to just take your machine to a professional to get the tension apparatus fixed. I've tried to fix things on my own with the tension and it's very challenging, although it can be done and I will link some videos below about fixing tension on vintage sewing machines. How much should you pay when you're buying a vintage sewing machine? So again, this goes back to my original point, which is that they're readily available. So you really don't need to pay a lot for them. And in fact, you may consider this unethical, but most people selling vintage sewing machines, even if they're selling one that happens to be in good condition or is a, like a really good model of vintage sewing machine, most people aren't really aware of its value and you don't have to pay a lot to get these vintage sewing machines. Now I have seen vintage sewing machines selling for thousands of dollars, but you really, really don't need to pay that much. And usually the ones that are selling for thousands of dollars are ones who have already been through the hands of someone who refurbished it and serviced it, and maybe they completely restored the paintwork the decals, the cabinet, and they put a lot of work in. That's more for antique collectors and that kind of thing. Or maybe if someone has a sewing machine in their family and it's a family heirloom, they would be willing to pay someone a lot of money to restore it. But you, as the average sewer who's just looking for a decent machine, you definitely don't need to pay more than like $200. You could probably get one for a lot less than that too. Okay, so now let's talk about servicing and caring for vintage sewing machines. So I will link helpful videos below about cleaning, oiling, and looking after vintage machines, especially for when you first bought it, because that's very important. When you first bought a vintage sewing machine, you're gonna need to do a lot of cleaning because chances are it's probably been sitting in someone's attic for years and years and years. It's gonna be pretty dusty. 
and grimy and you don't want to try to run your sewing machine until it's been cleaned and oiled. All the parts in these sewing machines are metal and they do require oil and lubrication to work properly. So again, I will link helpful videos below that I actually personally used when I was cleaning and taking care of my vintage sewing machine. I'll just go into some generals here. So if you want to take care of your machine on your own, again, you want to start by vacuuming it, dusting it, even if you have like a small duster buster or a small attachment for your vacuum to vacuum out the whole cabinet, the whole sewing machine. And you wanna work from the general to the particular. And what I mean by that is start by vacuuming the whole cabinet and the whole machine, and then gradually work down and down to vacuuming and cleaning the smaller components and crevices of the sewing machine. And that goes for vacuuming as well as just wiping off dusting and you can use things like Goo Gone or even a light oil to clean the sewing machine because usually they're kind of grimy and you need something else to get all that grime off. Sometimes they have old oil that's just become a bit like encrusted on there. So you need another type of oil to be a solvent and get that off. You don't want to use strong cleaning chemicals because that could damage the machine, especially the decals and the paint. Now, when it comes to taking care of your machine, so if something goes wrong or if it's not working properly, I will link some helpful resources below. There are a lot of helpful websites out there that you can buy parts for your particular model of vintage sewing machine. Again, that will be linked in the description. Most of these websites have a search feature where you can search for your particular model and then they'll have a list of of all the parts that they have for that model. And one more thing I want to talk about is attachments for vintage sewing machines. And this, to get into this topic, we'll need to talk about the culture in which sewing machines first, you know, were invented. So when sewing machines were first invented, you can see that they could have been kind of a tough sell to people because these were people who were used to sewing everything by hand and they were used to creating very beautiful, very complex garments all by hand. They weren't scared of the time it took. They were probably quite fast at their hand sewing. And more importantly, they I learned to create very, very intricate and complicated effects in their garments using techniques that were only possible by hand. So these vintage sewing machines were pretty smart and they came out with lots and lots of attachments to use for the sewing machines. And in fact, many of these attachments are things that we don't use today. And I think the reason for that is just that they were trying to sell it to this market of people who were used to doing everything by hand. And they might have looked at a sewing machine and been like, well, how am I going to do my rolled hems and my tucks and my gathers and my buttonholes with that thing? Like, give me a break. I'll just stick with my hand sewing. So they were smart and they came up with all these attachments. As I already mentioned, there are buttonholer attachments. There are tuck attachments. So there are special tuckers they're called, which make the process of creating pin tucks a lot easier by machine. And if I had had one of these when I was doing my Edwardian blouse, my last video, it would have made my job a lot easier. There are also special gathering attachments, rolled hem attachments, and so many attachments that I have a couple boxes of them and I just kind of look at them and I'm dumbfounded and I have no idea what they're for, but I'm sure they would be very helpful if I knew what they were and how to use them. So that could be something to look into as well. Okay, everyone, I really hope this video was helpful and it answered your questions about vintage sewing machines. I hope I've motivated some of you to go out there and find yourself a vintage machine because they really are fabulous machines. They're really great to work with. If there was anything that you'd like to know that I didn't cover, just drop me a comment below or contact me. And I'd appreciate giving this video a like and leaving comments and questions below and subscribing to my channel for more vintage sewing content. And you can also check out the accompanying blog post, which will be linked in the description, as well as all my social media platforms, which are linked below. And I will have linked a bunch of helpful resources in the description for you as well. Thanks so much for watching guys, and I'll see you soon. Bye.